Good afternoon. Welcome back. Good afternoon. I'm Damian Wetzel. I direct the arts programs for the Aspen Institute. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to welcome to this stage, and after uh, and in conversation, Clint Smith, poet, educator, the only high school English teacher on our roster today, uh, currently pursuing his PhD at Harvard at the intersection of culture, sociology, and criminal justice. Please give it up for Clint Smith. How's everybody doing? Can you hear me? Is the mic on? There we go. Uh, so my name is Clint Smith, and I am a, a teacher, uh, current PhD candidate at Harvard University, and a poet. And so I'm going to do some poems for you all. And who here is familiar with spoken word poetry? Raise your hand. Oh, you guys know all about it, right? And so what we like to say is that spoken word is not like golf. And so traditionally, when people go to a poetry reading, we think you sit, go there and you sit politely and say, hmm, hmm. Mm. Oh, he's got it already, right? So you don't do that. That's no fun. So we say, and then you do the little golf clap at the end. But no, here, this is an engaging endeavor, right? So if everybody likes something, can you snap? And if you really, really like something, we say you do the delicious chocolate noise. And that's when you go, mmm. Everybody go, mmm. There you go. All right. And so I'm going to do a couple poems, and then I look forward to having a conversation with, with Damien. Uh, so this first piece I've been thinking a lot about over the course of the last 18 months, uh, the sort of pedagogy of black parenting, and what does it mean for, for black parents to have to raise their children in a, in a country and in a world that is often taught to fear them. Um, and so this poem speaks to, to that. One night when I was 12 years old, on an overnight field trip to another city, my friends and I bought super soakers and turned the hotel parking lot into our own water-filled battle zone. We hid behind cars, running through the darkness that lay between the streetlights. Boundless laughter ubiquitous across the pavement. But within 10 minutes, my father came outside, grabbed me by my forearm, and led me into our room with an unfamiliar grip. Before I could say anything, tell him how foolish he made me look in front of my friends, he derided me for being so naive. Looked me in the eye, fear consuming his face. It said, son, I'm sorry, but you can't act the same as your white friends. You can't pretend to shoot guns. You can't run around in the dark. You can't hide behind anything other than your own teeth. I know now how scared he must have been, how easily I could have fallen into the empty of the night, that some man would mistake this water for a good reason to wash all of this away. These are the sorts of messages I've been inundated with my entire life. Always keep your hands where they can see them. Don't move too quickly. Take off your hood when the sun goes down. My parents raised me and my siblings in an armor of advice, an ocean of alarm bells so someone wouldn't steal the breath from our lungs so that they wouldn't make a memory of this skin so that we could be kids, not casket or concrete. And it's not because they thought it would make us better than anyone else. It's simply because they wanted to keep us alive. All of my black friends were raised with the same message, the talk given to us when we became old enough to be mistaken for a nail ready to be hammered to the ground, when people made our melanin synonymous with something to be feared. But what does it do to a child to grow up knowing that you cannot simply be a child, that the whims of adolescence are too dangerous for your breath, that you cannot simply be curious, that you are not afforded the luxury of making a mistake, that someone's implicit bias might be the reason you don't wake up in the morning. But this cannot be what defines us. Because we had parents who raised us to understand that our bodies weren't meant for the backside of a bullet, but for flying kites and jumping rope and laughing until our stomachs burst. We had teachers who taught us how to raise our hands in class and not just to signal surrender. And that the only thing we should give up is the idea that we aren't worthy of this world. So when we say that black lives matter, it's not because others don't. It's simply because we must affirm that we are worthy of existing without fear when there are so many things that tell us we are not. I want to live in a world where my son will not be presumed guilty the moment he is born, where a toy in his hand isn't mistaken for anything other than a toy. And I refuse to accept that we can't build this world into something new, some place where a child's name doesn't have to be written on a t-shirt or a tombstone, where the value of someone's life isn't determined by anything other than the fact that they had lungs, a place where every single one of us can breathe. And so when we think 
think about violence uh, and violence specifically against young people of color, uh, I think it's really important that we create a sort of holistic definition of what we mean by violence and that violence isn't just a sort of interpersonal phenomenon, but that violence is systemic and violence is structural. Uh, and so this next piece speaks to, to a sort of structural reality in the community where I taught um, and, and reflects the sort of interplay between how, how structures and systems um, stripped away from communities over decades and decades and decades um, affect what young people are able to do inside the classroom. As a child, my father would tell me stories of ancient Egyptian warriors traveling for endless days and nights across infinite desert plains, showing signs of endurance and bravery I could only dream of emulating. He would tell me that upon their return home, these warriors would be welcomed with a feast worthy of their bravery on the battlefield. Years later, as a teacher in greater Washington, DC, I too now find myself traversing a desert, though it is not the one I envisioned. A food desert is categorized as a poor urban area where residents cannot afford or are not given access to healthy foods and grocery stores. Every day at 2.45, I watch my students hop onto the sleeking submarine of a school bus, every block bringing them deeper into an ocean where the only fish they find are fried, where fruits and vegetables are playing an everlasting game of hide and go seek because there are no grocery stores here. Just liquor stores and Popeyes, Dunkin' Donuts and 7-Elevens, children born into a neighborhood that feels more pollution than solution, it is then I realize that I am not too far from the deserts I once dreamed of. See, whether Anacostia or the Sahara, it doesn't make much difference because these grocery stores, Southeast DC is no different than the Serengeti to them. Brown-skinned little boys like my students are nothing more than walking cacti, just a piece of scenery this world has taught everyone to stay away from. Brianna literally has a landfill in her backyard so she has a hard time convincing herself the world doesn't just think she's trash. Restaurants come and dump the remains of food she'll never be able to afford to eat. Three steps from her back door, Jose eats fast food five days a week because his mother works three jobs to take care of six kids and only sees her son when she arrives home from work. At the same time he is leaving for school, he has gotten so big that the excess fat bunker beneath his skin puts added pressure on his joints. His knees are literally crumbling under the weight of this world, Olivia watched her father shot two feet from her front porch. She wants nothing more than to go outside and play at the park after school, but gun violence has made a merry-go-round feel more like Russian roulette, so she doesn't go outside. Simply eats any processed food from the cabinet that will last long enough to prevent her from leaving the house too often. These are my students, my warriors, fighting a battle against an enemy they cannot clearly see. These kings and queens meant to feast, not to fester, but their zip code has already told them that their life expectancies are 30 years shorter than the county seven miles away. I can see the faults of my own ancestry shaking in their eyes. Diabetes and high blood pressure run through the roots of my family tree. Heart disease is as much a part of my history as shackles and segregation. So from my father's kidney transplant to Olivia's asthma, these things are more than mere coincidence. Both grew up in places more accustomed to gunshots than gardens. So tell me place doesn't matter. That the neighborhoods that are predominantly wealthy aren't the same ones that are predominantly healthy because when you're not choosing between buying your medicine and your groceries, health doesn't have to be a luxury. It doesn't have to be an abstract concept presented in academic journals and policy briefs. My students overcome more every day than I will in my lifetime. They are the roses that grew from the concrete, the budding oasis in the heart of the desert, and their lives are worth far much more than the things that this world has fed them. And so, so again, thinking about a, a broader and fairer and more holistic definition of violence, I think what's really important is to, um, to put that in conversation with all of the different socio-political phenomena that affect young people when they, when they step inside the classroom. And for me, one of those phenomena that I was confronted with was uh, the immigration crisis. And I taught a, a number of students in Prince George's County, Maryland, who, who were undocumented um, and who had family who were undocumented. And it was the first time that I interfaced directly with people who, who existed under the perpetual and ubiquitous threat of deportation um, for, and communities of folks who have been here for 
basically their entire lives. Um, and I think it's really important. Certainly, we can, we can both recognize immigration as a complex geopolitical issue while also ensuring that we're keeping people's humanity at the center of the conversation and that we're not losing, uh, losing touch with the fact that like, we're talking about people and not caricatures of people as some, as some people would have us believe. Every year, my students read Night by Elie Wiesel. Following completion of the novel, I assigned them the task of writing their own memoir. Maria came to America when she was five years old, wrote that she had to cross a river before she ever knew what it meant to swim, ran through knee-high grass as if the field were made of landmines, hid under the belly of trucks amid concrete and fertilizer so as not to leave a scent for the dogs. She did not know why she was running but she knew that her mother cried every night for her father. She knew she was beginning to forget the outline of her daddy's face. She knew that he worked 18 hours a day just to provide them with food that they could barely find at home. She knew that he loved them and wanted to remember what it felt like to hold his daughter in his arms. But Maria was five. She doesn't remember life in Mexico. She remembers kindergarten and sleepovers, and middle school graduation. She is more American than any slice of apple pie, but that is not what we tell her. We punish Maria for just following directions, for being a child who is simply listening to her parents. We tell her parents that they are wrong for wanting a better life for their children. We tell them that a 4.0 isn't good enough. We tell Maria that college wasn't meant for girls like her. We say, too much brown skin. We say, too much accent. We say, where'd you come from? We say, you don't have a number, so you don't exist. It's hard to convince someone to do well in school when the law tells them that it won't matter. When you're a number before you're a face. How convenient that we forget our own history, a country of immigrants who were once told we didn't belong, an assemblage of faces simply waiting for our country to see us. So I'm going to do one last poem and then bring Damien up. Um, and, and so. Part of what I think is, is really important about this summit in general is this idea of ensuring that we, we don't exist in the sort of silo of our own communities, in the silo of our own, our own bodies more specifically, and that we recognize uh, that we must be a stakeholder in the injustice uh, suffered by other people, even if it's not an injustice suffered by ourselves. And if there's inequality anywhere, that there is inequality in a world in which we are a part, um, so that there's inequality in our lives and we can't stand for that. And so this poem is written uh, as a means to, to ensure that I was holding myself to the same standard that I was asking my students to. There was a large anti-bullying initiative going on in my school, um, and I was telling my students to make sure they stood up uh, against like verbal abuse and physical abuse and everything that was happening in their school. And then I had to really step back and interrogate myself and say, what are all the ways in which I'm, I'm not living up to this same thing I'm asking my students to do? What are all the different ways in which I'm silent in the face of other people's suffering? What are all the ways in which I allow injustice to be perpetuated right in front of me? Um, and so this poem is, uh, is an effort to hold me accountable to be the sort of teacher um, for my students that I was asking them to be. As a kid in a Catholic family in New Orleans, during Lent, I was always taught that the most meaningful thing one could do was to give something up, sacrifice something you typically indulge in to prove to God you understand his sanctity. I've given up soda. McDonald's, French fries, French kisses, and everything in between. <laughs> but one year, I gave up speaking. Figured the most valuable thing I could sacrifice was my own voice, but it was like I hadn't realized that I had given that up a long time ago. I spent so much of my life telling people the things they wanted to hear instead of the things they needed to. Told myself I wasn't meant to be anyone's conscience because I still had to figure out being my own. So sometimes, I just wouldn't say anything appeasing ignorance with my silence, unaware that validation doesn't need words to endorse its existence. When Christians was beat up for being gay, I put my hands in my pocket and walked with my head down as if I didn't even notice. Couldn't use my locker for weeks because the bolt on the lock reminded me of the one I put on my lips when the homeless man on the corner looked at me with eyes up, merely searching for an affirmation that he was worth seeing. I was more concerned with touching the screen of my apple than actually feeding him one when the woman at the fundraising gala said, I'm so proud of you. It must be so 
hard teaching those poor, unintelligent kids. I bit my lip because apparently we needed her money more than my students needed their dignity. We spend so much time listening to the things people are saying that we rarely pay attention to the things they don't. Silence is the residue of fear. It is feeling your flaws gut wrench guillotine your tongue. It is the air retreating from your chest because it doesn't feel safe in your lungs. Silence is Rwandan genocide. Silence is Katrina. It is what you hear when there aren't enough body bags left. It is the sound after the noose is already tied. It is charring. It is chains. It is privilege. It is pain. There is no time to pick your battles when your battles have already picked you. I will not let silence wrap itself around my indecision. I will tell Christian that he is a lion, a sanctuary of bravery and brilliance. I will ask that homeless man what his name is and how his day was because sometimes all people want to be is human. I will tell that woman that my students can talk about transcendentalism like their last name was Thoreau. And just because you watch one episode of The Wire doesn't mean you know anything about my kids. So this year, <laughs> instead of giving something up, I will live every day as if there were a microphone tucked under my tongue, a stage on the underside of my inhibition. Because who has to have a soapbox when all you've ever needed is your voice. Incredible, incredible words. The choices of words matter. We talked about that a minute ago. Uh, the way we interrogate our own participation and enable all voices is all wrapped up mm. in, your, in your work and in what you've done. But the first thing I want to ask you is what do you think about all of this? You've been here all morning and how it relates to the work you've done and are continuing to do now on the, on the broader scale. Yeah, it's, it's a remarkable um, collection of people here. And, and I think I've been really challenged and fascinated and, and have learned a lot from, from a lot of the speakers. Um, and it's interesting, uh, so much of the, the talk is certainly an, a warranted you know, around policy, around politics. Um, and in my line of work uh, in, in the arts, part of what I'm always thinking about is how how can we keep people's humanity at the center of these discussions? Um, and how can we, so for example, I study uh, incarceration in, at Harvard. Um, and a lot of the, the work around incarceration is, is uh, statistical in nature, quantitative, uh, a lot of historiography, which are immensely important, right, in sort of showing us what, what's at play um, in the system and, and historically and, and contemporarily. But uh, sometimes I think the humanity of people who are in the system get lost um, and that we don't actually have to force ourselves to interface with the fact that like there, there are people mm -hmm. behind these numbers. Uh, and I think the same exists in, in all facets of, of policy conversation that, that sometimes the people get lost behind the policy and we can forget um, what we're fighting for and it becomes more of an abstraction than, than a sort of reckoning with the fact that, that these are, are people for whom these policies have really profound um, implications. Yeah, those, decision, those decisions, those choices that are made on the policy and politics level could be distilled back to individuals in a much more effective way, which to me makes me think about your chosen art form, mm -hmm. poetry and voice in particular, being such a powerful medium to express that humanity, mm -hmm. but also, you know, in the sense that a protest can also be lost in a, in a, in a, in a a sense of cynicism, it's not changing, and this is a protest. And to break through that, it seems to me that you know, you've done it on every level, you know, from your own personal space to a classroom full of young people who have varying levels of participation. In my work, I've seen that mm -hmm. moment when the eyes actually will rise up and actually see a pathway, mm -hmm. and poetry being just a, just a remarkably effective way of getting that 
interaction. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, I think it's really, for me, and you, you mentioned the sort of politics of the poem. And, and for me, over the course of the last year or so, I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to create political art? Um, and how can you create political art that has a specific sort of social utility, but, but isn't didactic, that isn't preachy, um, but rather illuminates the sort of reality of, of social phenomena that are taking place. Um, but similarly, I also think that, that in some sense, for a lot of the students and, and folks that I work with, um, that, you, you don't, that a poem doesn't have to be speaking to a specific social phenomenon necessarily to be political. Right? And so a few months ago, I was reading uh, Notes on the State of Virginia, which is Thomas Jefferson's memoir and sort of manifesto. Um, and in it, he says very clearly and specifically that black people are inherently inferior to white people in endowments of body and mind, uh, and that the slave is incapable of love, and the slave is incapable of possessing and sustaining complex emotion. Um, and that he wrote in a letter to someone about Phyllis Wheatley, who was largely considered to be the first uh, documented, published African American poet, um, that she's not a poet, right? Like, because black people cannot create beautiful things. Like, black people can, don't possess the sort of artistic and intellectual acumen to, to put things like poetry out into the world. And so I think of, like, what does that mean for, for this man who is largely considered to be the intellectual founding father of this country, for who is responsible for the conception of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, to, to have not thought that I was fully human? Right, to have not thought that I was capable of, of loving my mother or my partner or my students. Um, and, and so when you sort of create that framework for, for a lot of the young students of color that I work with, like the very act of, of writing a poem is in, of it, is in and of itself a sort of political act, right? And is in and of itself an act of resistance against a world that, that has constantly tried to render you caricature, if not render you completely invisible. Um, and so whether you're writing about Ferguson or a flower, uh, I think that like that is equally equally meaningful because you are rejecting a narrative that says you are not a full human being, and you're saying that I I exist and and am having a full human experience. And even though uh, either explicitly or implicitly, um, this country thinks otherwise. A lot of what you're saying is putting the historical context on the challenges of today, but using an artistic medium to to gain voice essentially, and. I'm thinking about that in the terms of, of power, mm. of how to get to a place where those voices actually are heard in effective ways. That the choices that are made, you know, understanding the past and, you know, cliche, true, understand the past to, to do better in the future, mm. but it is in those moments of decision making that, that voice really can or cannot be heard. Mm. Um, one of the things we heard earlier was that, you know, the end game is the job. The end game is job readiness. That's it. Education, yes, but it's about where we get to in the end. Uh, I'm not sure I feel about that. What do you mm. think? Uh, yeah, so it, it makes me think of, uh, so one of my favorite authors, Juno Diaz. Uh, I went and heard him speak one time, and he talked about this idea of the violence of vocation and how from like, as soon as young people come out of the womb, uh, we say, like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And when we say that, we're not actually asking them what they want to be or who they want to be. We're asking them what they want to do. And so from a very young age, you're sort of, a young person is unable to disentangle their vocation from who they are. Right? And I think that, that you know, we are all in, in part guilty of that, right? where we're unable to, to some extent, to figure out who we are beyond the work we do. Um, and again, this, uh, this sort of, rendering of, of a, a less than full human experience. Um, and I've always thought, you know, certainly uh, jobs are important, but I, for me, education is, is an emancipatory endeavor, mm -hmm. right, where, where students, uh, when I first came into the classroom, uh, I think I came in and was, uh, you know, my students are experiencing so much outside of the classroom. Uh, we're going to make this a safe space, a sort of bastion of excellence, and, and, you know, forget everything going on outside of the classroom, like, because here, we're just going to focus, and everything's going to be great. And I think I quickly realized how, how pedagogically and intellectually disingenuous that was, and unfair to my students to ask them to forget what they were experiencing beyond the walls of my classroom, and that the classroom shouldn't be a place to escape from that. It should be a place to, to tackle that head on, right? and to recognize that the world is a, is a social construction, 
right? And thus can be reconstructed and deconstructed and you uh, have agency and you can build the world into something new. You can build the world into what you think it should be um, and that you don't have to accept the world as is and you don't have to accept the status quo and, and, and that you're doing it in collaboration with, um, with, your, with your teacher and with the other students in the classroom and, and ultimately that makes you a, again, a, a fuller person who's able to sort of look around the world and, uh, and critically interrogate everything they see. Let's, uh, we have to stop soon, sadly, but I want to talk about that word interrogate for a second. So uh, Darren Walker earlier talked about interrogating privilege, mm. and that's so wrapped up again in the historical contexts, and in, in a larger sense we could say the choices of words and the choices of what you write about and how you communicate are interrogating your own voice. Mm. Like, what do I have? So given that and the work that you've done on the micro level, in the, let's say in the classroom, and now your work on the larger scale trying to take that to scale, so to speak, are you hopeful about the role of voice in influencing inequality in our society? Yeah, I think I am. I, I, I think that words are, are a means of engagement, right? And that what we have to, they provide part of what art and, and dialogue, hopefully art, serves as a catalyst for dialogue that ultimately pushes us to recognize um, that there exists a world beyond our own bodies, right? And that we might all live in the, same, in the same place and exist in the same world, but navigate and experience it very differently. And somebody before was talking about this idea of truth. Um, and I think it's important for us to think of truth kind of with, with a little t rather than a big t, right? And that like there is not a sort of singular truth, but instead uh, that ev because everybody navigates the world um, that in a world that is, in a, in a way that is constructed by their own experience and the facets of their own identity, um, that everyone's truth might look differently. Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's any less, uh, any less true. But we need to hear it. We need to hear it. All right. Thank you so much, Clint. Thank you.